G'day guys, it is the coach. Hope you are kicking butt, taking names and drinking your Aether Quartz reserves. It is Talking Lumineth and it's the second part. It's like five, I've had like five shows about Lumineth. I feel like I'm turning into an elf. You know, <laughs> two years ago, I'd make the joke that the only good elf is a dead elf. And now I'm a Daughters of Cain player. Now yeah. I have five, Perfect. I have Lumineth shows. So I think the corruption is real. This is the second video on Lumineth 2021. Mm -hmm. So as you all know, you've had an updated book from 20 to 21. Um, new rules, new allegiance terrain, new units, new lots of stuff. And I have a second person. We did a show with Hayden not long ago, and I have a second opinion to talk to me about Lumineth and teach me the filthy ways of hate the courts. It is yep. Jordan from... Seasons of War, g'day. How you doing? That was a long intro. Like I just like I just kept talking. That's okay. Elves are exciting to talk about, so you can't ever stop. Well, you you were you know like and it wasn't that long ago we were talking Broken Realms, Ideneth Deepkin, mm -hmm. and you've made the switch. Why have you made the switch? What's and, and for by the way, for anyone who ha doesn't know who Jordan is, Jordan is the captain of the world's team for canada almost at etc <laughs> the world's team um seasons of war battle reports uh overall general nice guy but um why lumineth why did you make the jump from eels to aether quartz so first thing i would say is i i haven't switched uh so so i'm a lover of all things elves uh so I you know have many children that that I you know enjoy and will will take out uh, from time to time, um, and the great thing about enjoying elves is you know if you if you have multiple elf armies, there's a good chance one if not all of them will be good at any given point. And, and bonus points is one of the lists that we're going to go through does have a bit of an IDK flavor, not a lot, but you have you have brought well, in spice. some IDK, you've brought in yeah. some IDK, but. Um, Lumineth man like like it makes me just realize that this is going to be an awesome supported army because we've only seen half of it we've got Tyrion's side and we've got potentially two other like four nations for a, a whole whole quarter whole half whole half of elves coming yep so i i mean Tyrion. so so actually to answer your first question uh, why i got into kind of Lumineth, um if you've watched the battle reports and seen our channel for a while, you'll know that uh, I have had an old High Elf army. Um, as soon as Lumineth dropped, I like rebased and painted up all my old High Elf models, and immediately like was you know playing with them. So so obviously that's you know the original incarnation of of Lumineth. So uh, I was a Lumineth player you know from a decade ago. So just just obviously yeah, this is kind of the, the army's the you know new realization of them. So it's just natural my, my goal has always been to collect every elf army so uh just had to do it another step on the on the process it sounds like a pokemon like collect them all collect all the elves <laughs> have you got have you got daughters yet uh in my closet in boxes so i have the army ready to go um uh, so again if uh we are recently you know working on adding new armies to the channel and whatnot for battle reports um and our our members chose for us to do zinch next i was hoping they would choose daughters of cain but uh, we'll get that one done soon you got a lot of fans in the chat by the way um and i'm excited to learn about idk if anyone caught the show that i did with hayden not too long ago um I had said to Hayden that I haven't really had the opportunity to play new Lumineth. I got to play a lot of old Lumineth, you know, Techless or no Techless, um, Cathalar with Umble Spell Portal, with lots of Sentinels and Wardens. But I haven't really played anything about the new, and mm -hmm. I haven't really seen a lot of people around me play with the new stuff. So I'm really curious to learn with literally a whole new book with a ter terrain with new units – how have those lists changed? Because obviously the tournaments are starting to pick up. Uh, GW's just announced a whole bunch in in, um, in America. Australia tournaments are picking up. I want to learn how IDK, IDK, IDK. I'm yeah. looking at you as an IDK <laughs> player. It's that person in the chat who said they were here for the uh, the elves on sharks. Like, no, wrong <laughs> show. I want to learn how how you're thinking about it because you know, as as an opponent, I hear a lot about the law seeker. 
I hear a lot about Severeth. I hear a lot about, you know, the Blade, like the, the, um, the, your new sword masters, um, quote, quote unquote. Yeah. So, yeah, I, 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 I want to hear, like, what's the, in your opinion, what changed for you when when we went from the 2020 book to the 2021, other than obviously the, the increase in units? Um, I immediately said, you know, as I had time to digest everything, look through the new stuff, the three biggest changes um, were the train piece, the sub factions, and uh, the new spell lore. So, not even any of the units. Now, now some of them are good, and I've played with all of them, and and they're they're fun and different things. But in terms of the most impactful changes from the new book, I think those are the ones that are immediately gonna you know you're see, seeing an impact from those. Um, again, the, like like Hayden said, the classic kind of you know um, Orland Legion battalion kind of builds. They're just getting injected with those new pieces potentially, um, and and you'll see you know definitely a sprinkling of new units, and you'll as well as like you know full on you know air nation builds or, or whatever uh, similar to like how you would see mountain builds, but uh, you know obviously the predominantly I think the most popular stuff is still going to be your you know Venari core um, unit type of stuff. Yeah, like for me, when I looked over the book, because like intellectually, I've read the book and I, I understand it, like intellectually, but the experience on the table, like the the first thought that I had was it's not like I've got a whole bunch of units that I now just need to throw away what I was doing in 2020. It's now about how I can, you know, mm -hmm. refine it. Um, you know, one of the challenges I think in the past was that Dawn Riders, for example, really had no support. There was not a lot of fast moving support. And now you've got, you know, your wind charges. Now you've got your wind mage. You've got so many cool new tools. You, you don't have to go down this castle route. And then basically it's like, do I do techless, no techless? Or do I go stone guard with, you know, my, my beefer of secrets or not? Like they were, they were kind of your only choices in 2020. Yeah. And how many archers, like how many archers was the other question? Yep. 30, 30 is the number 30 to 40. Well, if, well, if you, if you live in the UK, the answer would be like 80. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> everyone's got, you know, a different take, which is, I mean, that's the great thing about Warhammer, right? You know, you look at Hayden's lists and then I, I wrote my list and sent them over to you before watching the show. And our lists are so different, even when we pick the same sub faction um, with, for one of them. And, and that's the great thing about Warhammer. It's like, you know, two different people can have completely different opinions of, you know, how to run something. And that's, that's why it's fun and exciting. And, and that's really the point of the show. If you're tuning in for the first time, this is not about saying that this is the one and only internet list that you take to the new, the new G games workshop tournaments and go five and oh, well, six and oh, actually it's a, it's a three and three game. Um, this is not the, the one internet list to rule them all. It's just a bunch of ideas that Jordan has been playing, has worked. Um, listen to Jordan, listen to Hayden, go back to last year and listen to like Martin Orlando and Liam and other people who have talked to the channel and find the ideas that work for you and, you know, bring in what you like. If you don't like us talking about Sire, or if you like, you know, your metrica, then take the bones of this and kind of build it into your list. But before we move into the, um, the, the rules, I will ask the question in the chat here. I know you put it in the chat, but I want to formally, what is your favorite, favorite Lumineth unit? Oh, sorry. I jumped the gun. Um, it's, it's hard to say because I, there's a lot of different units I love. Um, the, my, the answer I gave was Lord Regent and that's both, I love the model, very cool rules that have an interesting impact on the table. Um, and you know, just all around love it, love, you know, for, for all reasons. Um, so, yeah, that would be my answer. Lord Regent, uh, very, very cool. He's sneakily very impactful in the game, I think. Yeah, I like it. My my favorite uh, came up in the announcement was the, your, um, your, the essentially the Battle Standard Bearer, being an old Warhammer <sighs> Fantasy Battles player, seeing the Battle Standard Bearer, I'm like, yes, let's make it great. So who knows what AOS 3 is going to bring to yeah, us, Jordan. Hopefully. Let's, when you, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just had to say, you guys were talking about the Battle Standard Bearer, you and Hayden, and... Yeah, that was heartbreaking. I, I bought him right away before we knew the rules. He was like the first hero I painted up. And yeah, and I just, like Hayden said, he's, I'm so sad that he's not going to see much action. I've, I've had him in a battle report so far, but yeah, not, not often. 
And D Nock, we will definitely talk Law Seeker. Like as if you can't talk Lumineth without Law Seeker. <laughs> but before we do that, I want to get your I want to pick your brains and um I want to hear from you um how you look at the allegiance rules, right? Because um when I pick up this book for the first time with no experience or the experience that I've had as an opponent, intellectually I understand it, right? You know, I get these these Aether Quartz reserves, a bunch of my units are going to be able to use Aether Quartz reserves, my Cathalar is going to be able to do some flipping shenanigans, and, you know, I've got my, my, my fighting two for every one. You know, I've got my lightning reflexes. I've got a bunch of rules. When you look at this based on your experience, based on the list that you're designing, what have you learned in your time? Have you realized that there's one particular Aether Quart that you really like more than other, or it gives you more value than the others? Have you realized that the Cathalar, because in the old book, the Cathalar was like, you took it with every list. And so you almost never went home without a Cathalar. What have you learned in your process between Lightning Reflexes, Absorb Despair, and the Aether Quartz Reserve? Um, I think... It, it stayed the same with the Cathalar, where I think it's hard not to take a Cathalar. Um, this is a very low bravery, well, you know, lower bravery army. It sips bravery, but unlike the actual low bravery armies, we don't really have, you know, all the battle shock immunities. So it's, um, we're really, you know, these kind of armies are really suffer. So that gives you uh, not only a hero to use it from, but but the two up um, to is just like basically a free CP you're getting in terms of giving an immunity to battle shock. Also has a very useful spell, you know, so that'll come up in games for locking units down and just all around good caster. We can uh, throw her in the train piece that we'll talk about. Uh, so Cathlar is still, still very, you know, you'll see her in all, almost every list. Hard not to take. Have you, have you found a reason not to take the Cathalar? Um, one of my lists I was building and I wasn't planning on taking her and then it just kind of worked out. I had the points. I'm like, it's hard. Again, it's just hard not to. It's like, you know, you could save 20, 30 points and take a cheaper caster, but for 20, 30 points, you know, I'm getting a, an extra CP on both mine and my opponent's turn from her ability basically, uh, or potentially. So it's, yeah. And, and just the abilities, they're so strong. The War Scroll spell just it, it is what makes it an auto include, and then everything else is just cream on top, in in my opinion. Yeah, and even even like the Battle Shock, it's not only the immunity to Battle Shock, but it's the flip, and and not only is that great for, I mean, everything, right? You think elite units flipping Battle Shock is huge against if you want to chew through a unit like you know Horrors, where there are fifty wounds in a unit of ten pinks. I mean, you you kill twenty. Every little piece, right, adds to the battle shock. You know, whatever you can add there is huge. What about lightning reflexes? Because um, previously, like mm -hmm. twenty twenty book, your combat prowess wasn't that great. Like in combat, I was never really worried about Lumineth. I'm like, eh, eh. I'm more I'm more worried about your spell casting and your shooters. But now you've got new tools. So how has lightning reflexes changed for you between book one to book two? Um, it hasn't changed a ton, except for if you're using the unit, new unit, sorry. So, well, that's actually, I'm going to go back on that statement immediately. Um, it, it is impactful because, like you said, actually, you do have more opportunities to, to be powerful in combat. Um, so one of the lists we're going to talk about is, I think, one of the best hammers, you know, utilizing it in, in Lumineth. And anytime you can activate two units before your opponent activates one, that's huge, right? That's like going at the start of phase and then again, you know, at the top of uh, the normal phase. So it's like, it lets you put two units into two different, you know, opposing units or double down on one unit you really want to take out before it hits back. Um, that's, it's super powerful. Um, you know, lets you protect your stuff a little bit more and just, it's, it's not something, cause we're not a huge, like you said, not typically a huge damage dealing army. Um, but it's just, it's another tool in the toolbox. And that's what Lumineth is, right? The huge toolbox. We don't have like one amazing tool that's going to win us, win us every game that we can rely on, but we have a lot of little tools that we can kind of try and adapt to the situation, um, which is one of the fun things about playing this army. And then, and, and, and one of the things that weren't fun when I was doing up these rules, cause I've obviously just gone, I've, I've been playing Sons of Behemoth. I'm moving into my gits, So I'm going back into a very, 
Gits is a very similar kind of set of rules to Luminef. Like you got a lot of synergies and a lot of little little intricacies. And I, I was reminded how intricate and rules heavy Lumineth was. So, um, so I almost imagine there's some rules that you just are there for seasoning to taste. But you know, you're really just sticking to a bunch of core rules and country, core abilities you're building around. Otherwise, it's like you know you're, you're chasing you're chasing your entail. Um, but your aether quartz now. I think when I spoke to Hayden and Martin Orlando and Liam back in the day in 2020, you know, one of the big things that we spoke about was a lot of magical supremacy. You know, the Aether Quartz was really good to get spells off. Have yep. you found that's still true today? Or have you found things like heightened senses and heightened, heightened reflexes um, have become equally or more valuable? Um, they're all good, but I think, fit still as others have said before it's like the plus one to save is just in, incredible um so really the way i look at it is like generally that's the one what i'm using the most is the reroll saves um you know especially for like you know warden sentinels really anything anything that you think is going to be the tar a target from your opponent that's where you want to save those for saves um whereas if you so the the next one I really kind of use a ton is is magical insight, like you said, or magical boost. Sometimes you want the plus one if it you know puts something out of unbind range or makes the cast go off. Um, but really, it's the the reroll. Um, with the potential reroll, it means we have two rerolls in the army, and and something like uh, and we'll talk about this in, in kind of non techless builds a little later. Um, we're obviously super reliant on Hishi and Twin Stones when we don't have Techless and huge spell. Um, between the terrain piece and Magical Insight, it means if someone, if our opponent takes the turn, we have an attempt to unbind that that and the spell, and we can re-roll that attempt, and then we can cast it and re-roll that casting attempt. Um, so again, so reliant. Um, if we don't have Hishi and Twin Stones, um, and and you're not, you don't have any pluses to cast then. Things can go real bad for Lumineth real quick if you if you fail you know a couple spells. So, what, just just so I, I want to I want to just double click on that point just for anyone who might be picking this up for the first time and not quite understanding mm -hmm. why that's important. So why is a reroll or why is getting off some of those spells critical to your success? Yeah. So looking at. Uh, really uh, almost every Lumineth unit, especially all the core stuff, is we are so reliant on our spells. So you look at um, you know, the Wardens and Sentinels, for instance, they do mortal wounds on sixes. Uh, with their spell, they do it on fives. So that's basically equates you know, to nearly 50% of their output, um, at least on the mortal wound side, if, if you do or do not get that spell off. And that's the difference of you know, killing a, a big threat or not. Um, that, that spell alone. So if you don't have pluses to cast from something like Hishian Twin Stones, which is giving you on average plus two to cast to all your units, uh, if you don't have that, it you know makes it, and you roll a couple bad rolls in a turn. Uh, again, it's it's kind of like a house of cards where things you know one th one piece falls, a couple tumble with it. So um, that's where the, the re rolls like we're talking about not only potentially help get Hishi and Twin Stones off, um, but also just let you reroll different spell attempts, whether, you know, it's um, uh, Total Eclipse, if you want to lock, you know, limit the opponent's uh, CP, it's the one where they cost two to use command abilities. Speed or, of Hish, like just all the, just exactly. those core spells. Yeah. I think for me, that's the, the big lesson is that you are really critical to those synergies and mm -hmm reminding yourself and making sure you cast the right spells at the right time, applying the right abilities. Um, and one of the lists that you're going to show us very soon, I was surprised to see you had two starting command points, and I'm curious to understand. Um, I haven't seen a Lumineth list with two CP up their sleeve already, so it'll be good to hear like where you're building this reliance and how you kind of Again, they're heavy synergies, and I know talking to um, to, to Hayden, you know, one of the things that I, I asked him was, you know, what what brings down his list and it, for him it was that arch regent um you know removing removing one of his heroes um so and i think that's a lesson for anyone who's listening to this who is either a lumineth player protect your heroes or for an opponent who is, is having a bad time with lumineth it's how do you take out those heroes and for me as well it was how do i take it without the magical supremacy 
And I think one of the examples that I shared was the Hurricana, the Celestial Hurricana, because it does mortal wounds as an ability. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because, you know, I could do mortal wounds from spells, right? It's easy. But to get them off against you, even like Lord Croak and his friends, becomes yeah. a hard deal. So looking for ways to be able to take down those castles, because fighting through Sentinels and Wardens and Stone Guard can be a really tough task. Oh, yeah, for sure. Playing devil's advocate here for anyone who's yeah. listening to this, going, "How do I beat Lumineth? This, this, this jerk at my like." And actually, I've seen I've seen in the Lumineth chats actually recently about Lumineth is MPE. Lumineth is having a bad experience. How come? Blah blah blah. Like, it's just understanding the army. It's understanding what makes it work, and then thinking about within your tool set, what have you got to counter mm -hmm. or handle those abilities? And every army is the same. You you, you slowly learn that process. And that, I, I agree. I think that you already see the kind of, you know, knee-jerk reaction calming down to Lumineth, where not only is it a new army, so people, you know, have a tough time, or it takes time to adjust, like you said, but also they have, like, a completely different perspective on how they play the game, which is new to AOS, where, again, you know, it's very common in other games to see control decks or armies or, or you know, control uh, play styles, whether it's video games or card games or whatnot, but it's the first time we're seeing it really um, in in AOS as like a full army. Now there's always Bellator and different stuff, like you know, different units that do different things, but that's like so much of this army um, can potentially lock stuff down. Yeah. No, look, as a Suns player, people are always surprised how fast Suns are, but also how much objective control there is. They're like, oh, mm -hmm. I didn't really think about it. And you, you play one or two games and you really learn, you start thinking about strategies. You know, you always get surprised the first time and then the second time you build around it. But, um, and for, yeah, for, any, for anyone who, who doesn't know what NPE is, if we've dropped an acronym on you, it's a negative play experience. Um, and it's often determined by things that um, just cause someone to have a bad time. And like Bellacore, for example, Dark Master, making you not fight or not use your rules is perceived as a negative play experience. But that's not this show. We're talking Lumineth. And one thing that you gained in 2021 was this terrain piece. Yes, sir. So without going into all of the rules... Has this become impactful in your lists? How do you think about it? Um, who likes to stand on top of your shrine, if any? Um, like, what's your what's your early thinking on this? Um, it depends on the list, how I use it. So the two lists we're talking about use it or, or need it in drastically different ways. So the first thing is, um, if you're within 12, you did a reroll from a hero on a cast. Obviously, like we were talking about, um, you really want reliability in your spell casting with Lumineth. So just, you know, having uh, a reroll is, is huge with your casting. And then obviously if you can throw a hero up in, in it and then you're basically getting a free CP both your turn and on your opponent's turn, which uh, again, like you said, one of my lists does have CP already, but uh, there are some reasons why I want a lot of CP in it. Uh, and so that's just another way of, you know, getting extra command points and it, you know, combined with like the Cathlar's ability um, gives us a couple options of not only are we saving command points, you know, fr from things, but now we're getting again, free ones to use for different stuff. So uh, definitely some fun, spicy options there. So I don't know if coach disconnected. Oh, there he's back. I'm back. Sorry about that guys. No worries. Young Jordan. I'll do it. Um, so yeah, so just was, was talking about the terrain piece and the command point, obviously. Uh, I don't know if I was still alive or, or not, but um, obviously... Let's go back to the original question. It's like, what's, what's changed? How has things kind of come about um, with this particular terrain piece and yeah. who, who do you like to sit on top of it? Yeah, so um, first thing, obviously, I, I definitely consider my deployment, uh, you know, with my heroes because there's the, the reroll... Um, for a spell with one of your heroes within 12, which obviously, again, just bringing the consistency to Lumineth and their spell casting is huge. So um, that's always a consideration for me. Um, and then uh, trying to get a hero up inside it for the command point. Now, again, one of my lists was command point. I already had two command points, but wants to use command points a little bit more. So in addition to like the Cathlar potentially saving command points, you're also now getting a free one both in your turn and your opponent's turn. So um, just some great usage um, to really 
uh, do some fun and crazy things with Lumina. Um, but then in terms yeah. of who I who I want in it, typically it's mm. it's uh, similar to Hayden the cast bar. Um, there are a couple restrictions on it. I, it has to be a obviously a small hero, but it has to be a hero without the mount without a mount, uh, which really hurts um, me with the the Lord Regent because otherwise I would yeah, potentially take lists without a Tathlar because of the Lord Regent's utility is is really good um, in 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 different ways. But he can't you know jump in the shrine, so he can't be the shrine guardian. So I'm not getting those you know potentially two CP around from him. Yeah, now it's interesting, you know, it's basically a foot troop hero, you know, no um, no monster, no mount. So, um, again, things like Cathalar, things like certain certain units that don't have that mount or the monster is is key. But it's an interesting one, and I think just how, how AOS 3 might come about. Um, is, there any, is there anywhere in particular on the table you like to put it? I imagine it's somewhere like central just so you can um, maximize the effects, or how do you like to deploy it? Yeah, so typically um, you look at the board and there's whatever, you know, four to, f you know, three to five objectives. You typically, I typically want to put it around centrally of where I want to control the board. So so whether it's between two objectives or triangling, you know, the center of three, um, somewhere central where based on, you know, my plan for the game in deployment, um, you know, it's going to let me support units on different objectives. Um, but yes, it, it's it's tough. So that's again, you have to consider your opponent's army, and you know, obviously the mission in terms, and, and as well as the terrain's going to impact where you're able to put that down. So um, it yeah. it also can't be deployed within six of objectives. So that's really limiting on you think like the the six objective missions with terrain on the board. Um, you are limited somewhat a, a, a ton of the time. But yeah, somewhere centrally, usually ahead of your deployment. So um, there's some fun uh, a neat little trick with it that i'll mention um actually jumping into it so when you similar to anything that you can garrison you have to be with within six at the start of your hero or sorry starting your movement phase and now that's not wholly within just within so you can have it um just like 5.9 inches from the front of your line and depending on if you know you're taking first or you know gonna get given the first turn you can have your castellar or a hero right on that line jump into the terrain piece, you know, turn one, not only does that, you know, move you your six inches up the board, but you also then have the size of the terrain yeah. piece to project your abilities and spells for the future and, you know, different things like that, again, command abilities, um, you know, that you're getting to use from the shrine is, uh, so lets you kind of jump forward. It's, yeah, I've, I've seen some shenanigans like that with the Bowin Vortex. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you can't unbind this and then kind of teleport yourself forward. No. But, yes, thinking about things because, you know, as long as you're within six, not wholly, just within, you're able to then extend the range because when you're garrison, you're now measuring from the terrain piece, not from the model. So all of a sudden, you've now gained so much additional movement or so sorry, so much additional range because you're measuring from the front of your shrine. So, um that's and good. I, I, just as a, another little uh, tip for people, because I see a lot of confusion in the past. I played again, played deep kin, so I'm used to train pieces, um, and th I'm sure there's going to be a ton of questions. So hopefully, uh, just to help people listening, when you are measuring to and from the train piece, you measure to anywhere on the model. Um, the reason for that, again, I had to, I did a ton of research with this with the uh, deep kin boats, is um, uh, how uh, Games Workshop currently, this could all change in AOS 3, but currently defines measuring ranges is measuring base to base. When something, and, and they define bases as like the, the black rimmed bases that a model goes on. So something like terrain doesn't have one of those. And in that case, you measure to the closest point of that model. So it could be, or of that, yeah, exactly, of the, that model. So it could be, you know, the bottom waterfall on the ground, or it could be, um, you know, the rock, you know, that's a little higher up. I, it might not, you know, come up lots, but um, there's sometimes confusion over that. So, thought I'd throw that little tip out there. No, it's a good one. No, it's a good one because you're right, and that's where even just thinking about tilting and the and the angle of your terrain piece is important. Just so, because mm -hmm. um, they're all not measured equally, but. Um, 
good, good tip. Let's get into your lists. Let's get into your lists. And the first one was the one that surprised me because when I look at the data, when I look at some of the list building stuff, this is not at the top of of, of, of lists that I see. You know, I see Umetrica. Mm-hmm. I see um, um, Jordan. You 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 um you told me how to say it um alumnia. before the show started. Alumnia, not alu. Yeah. I, I keep struggling, not because I can't say it, but I kept teasing Hayden, calling it aluminium, and now it's stuck in my head. That's the problem. It's not that I have an inability to say alumnia. It's the fact that I just keep mentally thinking aluminium, and I know it's not aluminium, but I can't. I'm just like this vicious loop. But long story short, hellion is not something that I see very often. Um, and I imagine when we start looking at the lists, I when I looked at your list, it made sense why hellion has started to come back up. So just for anyone who doesn't have the visual in front of them, maybe they listen to this in podcast form, um, Hellion is going to give you a couple of cool things. You get plus one to attack characteristics for missile weapons. Um, If they're within three of an enemy unit, that's an interesting one. Um, You're going to get yourself a command trait for the general, which is the Sky Race Grand Champion, which is a... I'm curious to hear about that one from you because I looked at that and I kind of initially shrugged my shoulders, went, meh, meh. I get one reroll. I'm like... Great, I can re-roll a one run roll or one charge roll or one cast. Casting roll was cool, but I'm like, the others, I'm like, eh. Yeah. What, what is it of Hellion that drew your attention? And and when we move to your list, what are the things that I need to consider when we get into the list? Yeah, so actually there's a couple interesting things to talk about. And actually, for, the first thing I'm going to do before we talk about this is mention Sire real quick. Um, now, you guys have talked about Sire a bunch. Obviously, this is the one everyone knows, which is two Aether Quartz, the, the most common sub-faction that we've seen. The, the reason I want to mention that is because when you look at Sire, it's very straightforward in terms of looking at uh, the, the allegiance abilities of Luminef, and then you look at Sire, and it's like, okay, this just builds on top of those. Um, whereas outside of Sire, a lot of your abilities don't work necessarily in conjunction with uh, your allegiance abilities. So looking at um, something like Helen, actually, it took me a while to dive into this one and and really figure out how I wanted to build it because um, you look at the ability, the plus one attacks. Well, typically, that's not really something you have a lot of control over um, too much. That is dependent on your opponent charging into you. So um, some of the other sub-factions outside of like Sire are, are... a little counterintuitive into how, in terms of how they work, and that's first off why you see Sire is the most popular. Sire so, is number one list building in Lumineth. Not to say that people aren't using the others, but it's just the most popular. And probably you're right because you get like two Aether Quartz instead of one. So all of a sudden, it just ties into what you were already doing. Yeah, yeah but anyways, uh, so the, you, you will be able to get use out of that, but. Uh, yeah, Helen, again, it's like a lot of the abilities, they're, they're interesting, they're cute, but they're not obviously near as impactful. But um, the, the first, uh, with my list that I built, first thing is Helen gives you uh, the wind chargers as battle line. Um, so you know, 130 points battle line, it means you don't have to take wardens, though you still might want to, because um, you know, otherwise you're, you're tied into taking at least two units of wardens for battle line. Um, so this this frees up you know points there um, if you don't want wardens in your list. So that's a great thing. But the command trait, like you said, is it's interesting. It'll you know it gives you a little consistency you know times that you want it or need it, uh, which is nice. Uh, never hurts. Um, but it's not it's not groundbreaking like a lot of stuff. Nor is um, nor is the artifact. I mean it's it's good. It's you know but it's not it's not game winning by any means. Um, yeah, and similarly, like, the, so it's hard to say, like, we'll, we'll get into it. I don't know if you want me to dive into the list too much yet. Um, I, we'll, we'll move to the list in a second. I just got one question for you, mm-hmm. and I'm just rereading the command trait for your general, which is a Sky Race Grand Champion. Does that, does that incentivize you, or does that make you choose – uh, not doesn't make you, but are you incentivized to make your your general a wizard so you can tap into that plus one to casting, or do you still think there's good use in taking a non wizard general, you know, f- for the run roll or the charge roll? Yeah, it's that's the thing. It's the o- only probably the only hero that's making use of all three of those is um, uh, is either like 
the Wind Mage if you want to do something with him, or uh, Lord Regent, because probably besides those two, you don't want any of your heroes charging. Um, but so there's trade-offs. Some you want, you know, you want to use the the run and charge rerolls. Others you might just be using it for the casting roll. But it, at least you have options. Yeah. I think I think for me when I looked at this list and I, I think what what drew my attention would be the command trait because the two other sorry sorry the command ability the command trait and the artifact are once per battle so you don't really build a list around a once per battle unless it's something amazing mm -hmm. the the gale of killing shafts is very situational you've got to be within 3 but the command ability being able to um to make a normal move out of combat um is is pretty tasty and probably ties in nicely to your first list, which is going to be the Wind Mage with the uh, Wind Blast Fan and the Transporting Vortex. You've got Severeth. Surprise, didn't see that coming. Who <laughs> thought Severus would be in a list? And then doubling down, you've got the Cathalar, who is the general with the Sky Race Grand Champion, the um, the artifact and the protection of Hish, as well as the Law Seeker. We have tripled down. We have got all three. It's like a full house. Yeah. Uh, the Law Seeker having Lambient Light. Um, you've got your three units of five wind charges. You've got 20 Sentinels, uh, another 20 Sentinels, one having Total Eclipse, one having Ethereal Blessing. Um, very attractive, and I like that you've added this because I think very early on, even last year, I was talking about Alapexes being brought into IDK to support Dawn Riders because back in the day, there was no support for Dawn Riders, and I had said Alapexes could be good, but you got an Alapex um, coming from IDK. You then got yourself the, um, the, the battalion that's going to wrap all your wind charges together, um, and you got the Twin Stones. So nice little juicy army. This is going to be fast. Um, that might be an understatement. Fast might be an understatement. Yeah, yeah, definitely is quick. Um, and there's actually, I, I did put total clips on the one unit of Sentinels. I would probably actually take speed of Hish there even too, because then you also have speed of Hish, because um, you definitely want that you know, with Lumineth as well to help with speed. Um, but this this whole list in conjunction with like the um, sub-faction abilities is obviously about... Um, movement and tying stuff up. So um, we to go through like even like the hurricane units um, get you know on the charge get an extra three inch pile in um, and be, you know have fly uh, with their pile in and or whatever um, with from different abilities and can pile away from units or don't have to move closer. Um, so this list is a lot of kind of movement trickery of tying stuff up, tagging stuff, harassing stuff with like. Um, the Wind Mage and Severith, and then obviously the Wind Chargers and, and even the Lore Seeker. So you have a lot of upfront harassment from those things of like getting in the way, stopping stuff from moving where it wants to, stopping stuff from deep striking where it wants to, um, stopping stuff from piling in with the Allopex. Um, you have the Wind Mage with that artifact. Um, it's an amazing artifact, so that's the big reason why you want to take the battalion. In it, I guess the battalion's also also great on its own. But uh, the Wind Mage's artifact is um, you can use it once per game if you're within three of an enemy unit. Uh, basically, on their turn, you can force them to do a retreat move. So you you know think of uh, just you know you you uh, you charge a unit, um, hit it with a net so it can't pile in on your charge phase after you've piled outside, you know, to the edge of three inches so that you're out of their attack range. And then, so they're tied up already. So they're, and then again, just different tricks like that. You got lots of stuff going on. Um, and well, uh, that's obviously the great thing about, you know, kind of hell on nation and a lot of the unit, you new units, sorry, is you have that harassment and that speed, but uh, it's not necessarily dishing out the damage. So you're trying to, you know, slow up the enemy with those units. Uh, and then really the the biggest damage dealer now you know is is those two 20 blocks of sentinels um, and you know obviously their, their threat range is you know board wide um, so you're using you know the harassment to you know uh, tie and tie units up you know block lanes and you know try and control the board and you know those those are the pieces that you're trying to throw into your opponent to, to try and make him focus on, even like tying up their shooting units so that your sentinels over a couple turns can be, you know, whittling down the key pieces. I mean, 40, 40 sentinels, if you get um, Lamb and Light off, they'll, they'll take out a big 
key piece in you know a turn. So you know two three turns if if they can't chew through and uh, get to your sentinels because you're tying them up with wind chargers or the heroes, uh, then then you're just you know getting to take off those pieces. Um, and you really want to be willing. You have to be willing to sacrifice, like even the the wind mage or the wind chargers, even Severeth at times. Um, be willing to sacrifice those pieces so that uh, you know you can keep your sentinels live. The other key pieces. Uh, so this is like uh, just you're excited. <laughs> full, full you're tricks. excited. I, the the movement shenanigans. And look, we don't know what's coming in AOS through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jerome in the chat made a comment about battalions. And look, we're going towards core battalions. We don't quite know if the current battalions are moving into like open and narrative play or how they'll be changed. We don't quite know everything yet. So, um, but this, the change is still, you know, like the, the list is still functioning without the battalion. Yeah. But the battalion yeah. gives you extra. It's not reliant. It's not change host. A couple of quick questions for you. And first off, I just want to call out what James said in the chat, which is a hundred percent true is that the command trait is not choosing one of the, one of the things It allows you to reroll um, each of them once, Correct. once yep. per battle. So, you don't have to choose to do a cast. Um, it's just if you don't choose a caster, then you only use two or three. Use. Exactly. Correct. That was kind of like where I was going with it. It was like, do you, does it mean that you should be going with a general who's a caster? Um, but a couple of questions. First off, you Cathalar, we know the power of darkness of the soul, making some basically take a bravery check to do certain actions. But you don't have Umbral Spell Portal. That seems to be a, a power pair with the, the Cathalar. A couple of questions then is why no Umbral Spell Portal? Um, how has not having Umbral Spell Portal changed the way you use the Cathalar and being able to use Darkness of the Soul maybe early on? And um, has has it allowed you to do other things that maybe... Because one of the challenges with Umbral Spell Portal is you seem to hug it. You know, you cast it, you stay in the backfield, and you don't really move because you then got to unbind it and cast it again if you're kind of moving up the battle. So I guess talk to me about not having the power pair. Yeah, I actually have stopped taking um, the the spell portal a lot in, in all my Luminath lists. Now I will take it from time to time for sure, um, but not not every time like I used to. And that's because we, again, have different tools. So now we, have, we can get... You know, up the board a little faster, get into our casting ranges a little faster, uh, use you know tricks like the the leapfrog into the terrain piece to get up the board further, and you know be able to kind of project our our spell ranges further, um, as well as leapfrog leapfrogging is getting yeah. in the garrison of the the terrain piece and then using the terrain piece to cast off. Yeah, just so, for anyone who might not make that connection. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I should have uh, explained that. But um, typically, you do want to use the the twin stones for like those or oh, sorry not the twin stones the the spell portal it's usually for like one spell that you really need um which is usually like uh storm of searing white light with tethless or uh burning samoom which is like the new anti-horde spell or uh as hayden mentioned i forget the name of the spell uh there's um uh the minus two to casting spell which is like sneakily one of the best spells in the spell lore that no one uses um so why and why why don't why, why don't you think people use it? I I am not sure to be honest. It's like the best anti seraphon spell, and I've seen so many you know seraphon matches where where Lumeth players like just doing two casts um, on a twelve. Then why I haven't mean, you taken it? Why haven't you taken it? Taken taken which sorry. The, the the spell the the minus two the casting oh I use it I use it all the time with techless hundred percent ah ah so so you're only taking it on techless typically typically okay um, well he, he knows everything I don't typically take it uh, and again I don't have spell portal in here and um, techless again gives you that utility for all the matchups where that's maybe a spell that isn't good in as many matchups so you want to take spells that are good in the most biggest the broadest range of of matchups uh, when again you don't have tech techless and access to everything um, but again actually so there is again here in this list we are reliant our one key spell is lambent light and mm. that's where you would want spell portal but the reason we put it on the lore seeker here uh, is because that lore seeker can deploy within three inches of units so the edge of 18 at, at worst if you you know 
uh, want to be a little further and cast that Lambent Light. And if you throw something at Twin Stones 12 inches behind him where it's buffing the rest of your army, and so he's still getting the benefit of Twin Stones, you're getting Lambent Light on that one target uh, that you really want to take down, which obviously benefits the Sentinels huge in terms of their potential output. Uh, so, so that's why that's the big reason why I don't have the uh, spell portal in here is uh, you're using the lore seeker to get that spell in range turn one. Um, so different, you know, a good reason for that, I guess. So talk to me about this lore seeker because one, everyone is talking about it at the moment. It seems to be um, one of the more popular, even as an ally or as a you know as a Cities of Sigma player looking at my settlers gain. Um, the lore seeker is certainly one that I'm thinking about. And the most the most popular reason to bring in the law seeker is that um, lone agent ability being able to deploy. Basically, you put it in reserve, and then in the first battle round, you deploy it on the table somewhere, as long as it's outside of three from an enemy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is, that, is it all? And, oh, and it's not in your territory. So, yeah. and you set up this model within sixes of. of yep, cool. So. Talk to me about, I'm just rereading the rule to make sure I don't say anything that I shouldn't. Um, how do you think about that? Like when you have that law seeker and you're putting it down on the table, are there things that you are trying to do, things that you're trying to avoid? Like what's in your your, your thought process with the law seeker deployment? The the first question you have to ask when you're using the law seeker is, is am I going to have first turn or choice of first turn? Um, because that impacts how you want to use him. Uh, so here, I think we're like a five or six draw. Oh, no, we're higher than that in this list. Um, All right. So let's let's assume you're going to lose priority. Let's say you, let's say you don't get the choice of of mm -hmm. determining who goes off first or not. So so then you have to look at what use you're getting out of him. So if your opponent, if you deploy him uh, in your opponent's territory, you know, is your opponent able to deal with him turn one? Um, so that that's the big question where sometimes you might actually not want to do the the special deployment from his war scroll. Um, sometimes you do though because you want to bait your opponent into taking first turn. Um, again, if if you put him on an objective where he you know holds that objective until he dies, and is also in lambent light range, it can bait your opponent into taking first turn to deal with him, which also forces you know your opponent to move up. Um, and if you have another source of lambent light in, in the list, which we don't in, in this list, but you might want one, um, then they're potentially getting that unit into lambent light range anyways. And you spent you, you lost 160 points, but you potentially pull your opponent out of position, make your opponent take first turn where you have the, the chance at the double, you know, right back. Uh, you know, lets you kind of, at worst, if your opponent has choice, it lets you play with mess with their heads try and influence uh you know their strategy and uh force them into a, a bad play or a misplay or overextending or something um so there's that element of it and then again you know if if you're getting given first or taking first turn uh you immediately you know can potentially claim an objective that you can hold on to pretty reliably especially if you're getting you know wind chargers up screening and uh with the different tricks of um, you know, tagging unit, units and all that fun stuff. And then you're putting him in lambent light range, which is obviously a, a huge one um, with, again, potentially you want to put him down somewhere that's within range of where you're playing to put Hishi and Twin Stones, which you got to know where you're, you know, putting Hishi and Twin Stones when you start deploying. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, looking at a mission, if you're putting, you know, Twin Stones, you know, in front, center, you know, in front of your army, you got to make sure the unit leader from each of your units is within 12 inches of that point. So if you put that a little bit forward and, and can put the lore seeker on the front edge of that range, then he's getting, you know, whatever modifiers to cast, which again, Lamb, Lamb and Light being probably your most critical spell in this list, you're at least getting, you know, more reliability uh, from that, as well as the potential reroll from the terrain piece or um, the Aether Quartz. So... It, it's interesting, right? Because you know the the last set of rules on the law seeker is is what makes it worth its its weight in gold. If you set up this model within six of an objective and there are no enemy units within six inches of it, which is very likely it's going to happen when you put it down for the first time, um, you gain control of that objective, and the opponent cannot gain control while while it's within six inches of it. So it means, as you said, you're baiting your opponent to come for that objective. 
Um, I think of something like focal points, you know, a middle objective that might be worth more points than others. Um, Scorched Earth, where there's eight of them and some armies can't can't hold four and, retain, and go for four. So all of a sudden, you've got some really good movement shenanigans by being able to deploy it and force your opponent, as you said, to either ignore it and you start scoring points early mm -hmm. or that you're going to force them to move up and then you can take advantage of it and there's a lot of shooting here a lot of magic that allows you to then go for that um yeah you might trade off the 160 point hero but you've now baited them into your ranges earlier because mm -hmm. you really you know as a, as a shooting army or a magic army you've only got up to five five turns to do your thing so you know not being not in range for the first time means that you sacrifice one of those five so um i like it yeah so and, and again like there's just so many tools in this army like if your opponent you know puts their hammer forward because they have to commit a decent amount to kill kill the lore seeker especially a uh, big thing is you want to put him in terrain if you can if there's terrain on an objective because uh, then he's you know gets plus two to his save from in combination with lone agent that may change with uh, aos3 but um, you, he's on a two up save, you know, potentially you, you give him, you know, all out defense. He's rerolling ones. You know, if you want to throw a ethereal blessing on him, if your opponent has something with a lot of rend, then he's, well, I mean, you can't do that and, and get the benefits of the pluses to save, but different, different options. You've got options. You've got options. Uh, and, you know, like it, it's a quite a durable hero, especially because you can automatically put it in terrain, which then brings your save down to a three plus. So, uh, and as Matt said as well, you know, like those victory points are worth their weight in mm -hmm. gold. And um, that can be a good trade off. But I think the risk is committing too early, um, you know, just throwing away this piece and being too aggressive without a strategy, which is why I wanted to bring it up with you. Yeah. Um, and, and there may be cases because there's a lot of the top armies, they can just deal with him, right? Look at Seraphon, Zinch, you know, High Rand or KO that they can just shoot him off at something with mortal wounds. It's like there might be a, you know games where you're like, okay, I know if I put him forward on uh, on certain missions where there's no objective to put him onto, it's like I'm not getting any utility out of him if I use his deep striking ability. Then you just deploy him on the board normally, and you just have another you know kind of hero in your backfield supporting your army. And as Carlos has said, you know, if you really like the Law Seeker and you want to kind of tap into that a little bit more, you know, you can bring in the Blade, the Blade Dudes. I don't think that's quite what the War Scrolls called, but the the Blade Dudes. <laughs> the um, dudes. The but then you've also got, you know, as like Jerome said, you know, you could tap into the Sanctum as well, the other endless spell. So again, either way, you know, you've got a range of different tools if you really want to build around the Law Seeker as opposed to the Cathalar or, you know, the, the yeah. wind charges, you know, tweak and, and modify to taste. Mm -hmm. Before we move off this list, though, I, I'd be remiss not to ask you about the loss, uh, the, the Alapex, given that you are coming from an IDK background. So what made you choose the Alapex as opposed to maybe another 110 points into something that's already existing in your book? Um, and maybe introduce people to the net launchers because I think maybe yeah. for someone who doesn't have experience with the shark, they might not know how cool and powerful the net launcher is. For sure. So it, when you dive into this list and look at like Severeth, the Wind Mage, the you know Helon uh, Nation abilities, the Wind Chargers, the the Hurricane unit abilities, a lot of it is about movement and uh, you know piling in and and how you can kind of mess with that, especially you know, Severeth as well. Um, so the Alapex is just another tool in that arsenal of um, if his net hits, which is just hits, um, it doesn't have to be you a know, wound or do damage. But if it hits, the opponent cannot that the unit it hits cannot pile in uh, that phase or that the upcoming combat phase. So for the rest of your active player turn, um, which again just gives you another way to tie up key pieces, where if you can tie up you know if you, if a unit has let's say three big key pieces you can tie you know one up with a unit of wind chargers by tidy on the edge of three or with severus because it's only piling in one inch uh you're having the net launcher you know tie up another unit uh, with wind chargers that is not piling in until your opponent's turn where sure it'll kill the wind chargers but you tied up that unit for a turn and then you're killing the third unit with you know or third hammer with sentinels that's what you're doing you're trying to do 
until you've gotten rid of all their key pieces. You're, you're tying ones up that you can't deal with right away, so you can you know focus on one or you know lets you do that. So the net is just a, another great tool there. Uh, I'd have to double check, but I think Lambent Light. I don't know if it affects all units that shoot or just Lumineth units, but that's something to consider. You could potentially get the reroll from that. Um, but I'm I'm going to assume that it's it's just Lumineth. I, I, I just, I would usually assume. it doesn't cross over, but mm -hmm. but maybe a, a list scientist in the chat might actually realize that no, it's actually broader. And, and typically, anyways, if you're putting Lambent Light on a unit, that's typically what you're shooting with your Sentinels. So that's the unit you're trying to kill. So the net is probably not very useful in that situation if you're killing the unit, anyways. Um, but it's just a, just another potential tool, something for your opponent to be worrying about. Um, as is everything, right? So if you throw the lore seeker down, like we were talking about, your opponent has to consider the fact that you can be in his backfield if he moves forward. Mm -hmm. So if he leaves stuff, his own objective, you know, undefended, you can potentially be throwing a bunch of wind chargers and Severeth back there, you know, killing key pieces, you know, heroes if uh, if they're left unguarded or you know, home objectives. All right, and uh, Matt, Matt is fact checking. We might need a fact check on a fact check, but uh -huh. uh, I'm being told rules are written. You Sweet. can re-roll with Lambert Light on the net launcher, so um, we might have uh, discovered some list tech here. Um, but for me, like the the Alapex is, you know, the you don't normally use the Alapex on a hero, for example, because normally they have a two or a three inch range that, you know, they can ignore the the um, the no pile in. You really want to tag in those big units that, you know, you, you, as you, as Jordan said, you tag them and then they're not able to string out or pile in. And it really just reduces the amount of damage that you take uh, or receive back, let alone the t fighting twice before the opponent gets to fight for the first time with lightning reflex. Yep, totally. And I mean, you can use it on heroes too, if as long as they only have two inch range, and you can tag on the edge of three, um, or you know, move move your guy back um, if you activate him before you you know you let your opponent do it. So, j just a, another kind of useful tool. All right. Well, I'm getting some conflicting fact checking in the chat. All right. Co one more question about this list before we move on to the other one, Jordan is Severeth. <laughs> Sephiroth does lots of cool stuff. Sephiroth doesn't do a lot of damage from my perception. Now, you might agree or disagree, but when I look at the War Scroll, it doesn't seem to do a lot of damage. It seems like it's a hero sniper, and, and the movement in both you and your opponent's turn is an interesting mechanic. What have you learned playing with Sephiroth? Um, yeah, what have you learned with playing Sephiroth? It's like you say, he doesn't do a ton of damage, so you're using him to to harass. So tying stuff up in the you know whether with, with his ability of uh, limiting pile ins, you know, honestly sometimes you're tying stuff up in combat and sacrificing him. Um, you know for you know if if you're you, you can put him in a key position to slow your opponent down for a turn or two. Uh, so you're doing stuff like that. You're threatening back objectives. You're threatening heroes. You know think of the missions where you get bonus points for. Uh, having a hero on object on an on an objective, um, and even potentially the one where it's burning your opponent's objectives, he can be on you know a different objective every turn, uh, potentially getting an extra point for burning. You have a bunch of you know wind chargers bouncing around with him, and they're doing you know it's again just harassment. There's lots of different tools in here. Um, your opponent, you, you can use him again. Your opponent, you have so many threats in this list where. Mm. Um, uh, things that your opponent has to deal with, right? So the lore seeker, they have to kill him. They have to dedicate resources before they uh, can move on to something else. They have to dedicate shooting resources or magic resources in terms of dealing with Severith, uh, or you, you're tying their combat units up before they get to your Sentinels. So again, this is just using them as speed bumps, roadblocks, plodding lanes, uh, again, with, with their fast movement and you know flying at times or double moving. Um, and so you're doing that to slow them up, you know, while your sentinels have a couple turns, hopefully, of uh, taking, you know, taking the threats down. Am I right to assume that with Severeth, you this is this to me when I look at Severeth, it looks like a model that is more of a late game threat as the as the board kind of starts to contract and you know attrition starts coming in and more space gets opened up. 
are you finding the benefit really in the early game or the late game or you know a bit of utility with both because i imagine the speed allows me as you said to start going for objectives you know turn three turn four turn five that are becoming exposed you know being able to use the retreat and charge being able to move the the movement in the sh in both of our shooting phases that to me allows me to really jump around the board and steal objectives and force me to start moving my army to kind of reclaim it and then you can jump jump to another objective so it's really hard to especially if you don't have a, an army that's fast it's hard to handle and protect and you know what i mean like I, where have you found the value with severus yeah i think it definitely depends on the kind of the mission and matchup but because there are times where again you want to use him to to tie stuff up in combat because that pile in ability if you can do that like tie up a couple units it might be worth sacrificing him turn one or you know turn two if it ties up you know an opponent's fast moving threat you know uh, or you know limits so, so so sometimes you want to throw him away sometimes again though if they can't deal with him or they can't get to your sentinels right away then you can just bounce him around harass stay just outside of threat ranges um or within threat ranges blocking an opponent so he can't move up and then move in, uh, you know, at the end of his phase. So, um, and this right here, the uh, the two plus shooting down terrain yeah. pieces. I've been enjoying my my son's army destroying faction terrain right on two plus. I destroy it. So, like OBR is a prime example that I've loved mm -hmm. because OBR and even Seraphon's terrain pieces in the middle of the board, and it's an easy big base. So two up, I shut you down. But then there are things like um, Flesh Eater Courts being able to summon off the back of their terrain piece without f with for free. Um, Depravity and um, there's a lot of faction terrain out there. The 2 plus and the speed to get to it makes it an auto-include. Like, it's such a good model. It's, it's, it is very good. I, I honestly, maybe not auto-include, maybe not auto-include, but, but it's, 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 it's the utility it's, value is, is awesome. God, great utility. Same with the lore seeker. A lot of, you mentioned earlier, a lot of people see lore seeker as auto-include. I wouldn't go that far. It's a great no. tool like, you know, many other tools in Lumineth. Um, but again, if you're thinking about your top table matchups, well, most of those armies can deal with him. Uh, mm. So, and then you know, potentially investing into blade lords or um, you know the sanctum and the spell, really cool. I love it. Done it myself. It's a lot of fun. But some matchups, it won't help enough, and then you've just you know sunk even more points. And looking at things like you know sanctum or spell portal is a prime example. If you take spell portal in in your list, that's ten bodies gone, because it's not just seventy points. With the numbers of Lumineth, that often ends up being 10 Wardens or 10 Sentinels or another hero. Um, so, I, I will respond to Jerome here. As a, <laughs> as a Gloom Spike Hits player, I'll say, bro, get to my Loon Shrine. I'd like to see Sephiroth get within one inch of my Loon Shrine. I have 160 Grots protecting that Loon Shrine. Good luck getting within one. Well, it's not garrisonable, so he can land on your Loon Shrine. But you've got to be. Uh, He's how fast does he move, right? Yeah. That's... Well, if you if you're gonna do that, I want you to put the model on top of it. Yeah, I know. Obviously, this is like one of the things that we all want to be fixed in AOS three is like the terrain rules of like gimmicks like that, right? And it's again, this is. No, you make a good point. You make a good point. Yeah. So if you can char if you can charge and land your model around it, um, no, you, you you're 100 percent correct. You, because it flies, you can actually go on top of the terrain piece. So well, and, even if you try to screen around it, um, as long as there's the space to charge, obviously. You, so here's the thing. Again, so this is. Uh, again, you, with with the current terrain rules, again, we all want them to get better. And you know, um, but with the current rules, if you're on the top of that shrine, you're probably not within three of any models. So you wouldn't have even have to have charged to get on top of it. And obviously, he moves super fast. Uh, you you have potentially speed of hish or you know something to get on there. So you can potentially get on there, be outside yeah. of three. Depends on it. Depends if they're using the South Coast um, GT measuring distances from heights. I think there's some some technicalities, and depends on what terrain piece we're talking about. But we get we're on the we're on the yeah. nuances here. But you're you're right. That makes a really good point. Because you fly, you can get on top, which means that it can be even harder to screen uh, for certain terrain pieces. So good. Yeah. That's a really good point. 
yeah, I have to make a caveat because after you know Hayden was, you know, coming in with some you know off the wall fun lists and good lists for sure, and actually some really interesting things that I I liked watching that and learned from him, um, but like how I looked at the game and how our play group looks at the game is like, I mean, none of us, you know, are, are overly concerned about MPE. We all have a good rapport, even our local community. It's like, we have such a tight knit community, you know, and all our team is like, our most important thing is, you know, you know, being a nice person, being respectful, uh, being, you know, clear with all your rules and, you know, your intentions and, and whatnot. Uh, so we're not, you know, we have fun trying to like, you know, break the game, quote unquote, or, or dig into the, like, that's that's the part we enjoy where it's like, we, you know, br bring the filth and enjoy like, you know, pushing the limit on, on kind of, you know, um, what the best lists we can come up with are. So um, all, all always within, you know, you know, respect of, you know, always within the, you know, the, the rules and, you know, um, be, being completely open with your opponent and whatnot. But it's a lot of, you know, that's, it's it's fun trying to you Matt, know. Matt, Matt, but d despite your big long uh, speech that you're going to take into the Grammys or something, uh, Matt tells me that they, he dislikes playing you all the time. So, um, so we'll, we'll <laughs> that, that's right. No, he also said no. kidding. He also said no. kidding. But to to Matt's point, um, Matt did call out that scour from Severeth happens at the start of the charge phase. So if you do want to shut down a piece of terrain, it happens at the ch start of the charge phase and you must declare that you're not charging in order to do it. So um, you need to be able to, to I guess, get in close to the terrain piece or already already be or, or already be there and then hold it for at least a turn and then activate it. Yeah. Yep. So, cool. but yeah, no, Matt's, Matt's a, a great Lumineth player as well. We've talked about this, these guys a bunch. No, nah, that's great. Um, cool. Anything else you'd add about Helion, Helen, he Helion, Helon, um, <laughs> before we move on before to, to what I'm going to mispronounce as, um, aluminium, but it's, um, yeah, if you like movement and trips, this is a lot of fun. Again, might not be the, the strongest Lumineth build, but I mean, it, it's strong. It has a lot of tools, uh, and your opponent, you know, it's gonna, you'll, you'll, you'll pose some problems, which is always fun. All right. What's our second list, Jordan? Alumnia, not aluminum, no. not aluminum, alumnia. So we're talking alumnia. Um, we, if you watch the Hayden show, you already know what it does. If you haven't, you get the, um, at the start of the game, you get a free move for three friendly, um, units. Um, but they can't make a run move. It's just a normal move. So it's a nice little, you know, like advance to kind of pop out those deep strikes. Um, you get, uh, one friendly, um, unit that, it can it can run and charge essentially. Um, you've got you've got your waste stone. I don't think Hayden talked a lot about the waste stone. Like it was kind of like eh. And you've also got a command trait, which is a burning gaze, which at the start of the combat you can uh, basically just do a mortal wound on a two plus. Um, what drew you to this as opposed to the others? Um, well, again, I love movement. Uh, obviously, I played deep Ken. Before that, I played or I still do play Sylvaneth. Um, you know, especially in the old book where they had tons of movement tricks and they still do, um, but not near as much. I, I love that part of the game. Obviously it's such an in integral part of the game. So, you know, coming from into, uh, Lumineth, it was obviously an adjustment, you know, Sire and the slow moving castles where I'm basically, you almost feel like in Sire, you're, you're playing for the tie or a late game win. Um, you're not necessarily trying to push too, too hard fast, but this you know, immediately caught my eye because of the movement flexibility of uh, the pre-day moves, um, yeah. you know, the, the run and charge, uh, obviously like the command traits neat, the waystone is neat and there's some cool tricks with that, but, but it's just the movement that this allows, which uh, you look at a lot of the weaknesses of Lumineth, um, something like, you know, facing KO and uh, being able to take Teclis off the board. Um, this now, now you don't have the double aether quartz of Sire, but with the pre day move, you can screen out so they can't get enough shots into Teclis. Um, and that, and that has been a hard counter, right? You run Teclis, you come against KO, there's a really good chance, you know, even with the um, the ethereal spell, there's a good chance you're just going to get shot off the board. So, claim the field as an ability, being able to move forward three units is just um, so good to push your opponent back. Yeah. And you, you also, um, 
saw, you see with Lumineth lot, there's objectives that are six inches from your territory that you couldn't get on turn one if you were in Shining Company. Well, now you're on those turn one. You look at a mission like Blade's Edge, where there's three objectives right on the line, and it's so strong for your opponent to take first and capture all six. Well, you just pre-game moved onto all three, so they can't capture your three at all. Mm -hmm. uh, or they have to invent, you know, get so many bodies on there. So it's an amazing tool. Really helps shore up some of the weaknesses of, of Lumineth. Um, at the caveat of not doubling down on the strengths. So again, this is talking about Sire being really intuitive in terms of how it plays and how it's designed with the book. Uh, you know, that linear design that uh, Vince talks about. Um, this is not that, you know, claim the field um, and seize the moment, run in charge. Those are two abilities that uh, really you want to be outside of Shining Company actually with a lot of stuff because you can't run to run in charge if you're in Shining Company. Uh, great utility though, if you, you do your deployment, you use a pre-game move, you deploy in Shining Company, uh, and you see how the game goes or the deployment goes, and then you can make this decision with the pre-game move where you can break Shining Company in your pre-game movement so that come turn one, you are able to run and charge uh, if you want to. So you can deploy in it, stay in it if you if you want to be defensive or if you're going to look to go a little more offensive, uh, you can break Shining Company with that pregame movement. Yeah, so much like the last list, I feel like the abilities and the command ability are what probably draws you to the sub-allegiance and then everything else is like cream on top. Mm -hmm. um, claim the field and seize the moment to me are the two good things. For sure. um, but talking about alumnia, not aluminium. Um, it took two shows, we're getting there. So we've got the Cathalar with the Silver Wand and the Total Eclipse. You've got your Lord Regent with the General Burning Gaze Waystone Protection of Hish. Um, the Light Altharian. Didn't think I would ever... I have not seen the Light of Altharian on the table ever. I haven't seen it on the table. No one's run it. Um, so cool, I'm huh? curious. To, I'm, yeah. I, I know it's cool, but like I haven't mm -hmm. actually seen it. Um, so I'd be curious to hear what you've what you've picked up along the way. You've got 30 Wardens with the Speed of Hish, 20 Wardens with the Ethereal Blessing, 20 Sentinels with Ethereal Blessing, 20 Sentinels with the Speed of Hish, 5 Dawn Riders with Lambient Light, wrapped up in the um the legion battalion and then you've got your twin stones and an extra cp so you're actually going two cp so you'll start the game off with two cp plus obviously the first one you'll generate at the start of the battle um coming plus in at a total potentially two. free runs from the train piece oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yes you, you yeah. just you have lunch you got like seven commanding being your in your backfield no um how does this list differ talk let's let's talk so is the Cathala playing a similar role? Yeah, you, actually, um, there's a good argument here where you still want your Cathalar as a general. Pros and cons side the Lord Regents with the Cathalar. Um, but again, Cathalar using command abilities from them, potentially if they're in the train piece in Central, is more beneficial than Lord Regent, but you have options. Uh, you could go either way. Uh, so this this list is a variation on like, a, you know, a, a kind of core that I've, been building a ton of armies around, whether it's, um, I basically, it's like you build, you know, 1300 points in Alumnia and then the last 600 points is super flexible. Uh, so this actually is a list that I'm going to play in an upcoming match on the channel, uh, for a bat rep with the Light of Altharian, because you, um, Light of Altharian is like everyone's favorite, you know, hero in War Scroll that nobody sees, right, in, in Lumineth, because obviously great model, but like really cool rules. He's, you know, uh, ethereal, uh, really, really consistent damage output, um, but unfortunately slow. And obviously uh, this sub faction really helps with that. Now he can't do the pre-game movement, um, but he can run in charge. Uh, so just to talk about first why, why Altharian's in the list, he can run in charge. So that's already potentially a 12 inch movement. Uh, CPs, tons of CPs if you want to auto run six. So there's 12 inches movement there. If you throw speed of hish, that bumps him up to 18 inches. So Light of Altharian, uh, ethereal piece that again, his biggest weakness was he couldn't get places fast enough. 
Um, and he's, he's ethereal with a three up armor save. So he's, mm -hmm. his armor save is already three up. And yeah. uh, ethereal, for anyone who doesn't know what that does, means that you can't positively or negatively modify that. So things like Rend, for example, but also the Light of Lotharian couldn't benefit from, say, cover. So um, yeah. three is three no matter what you do to it. Yeah. But with, with a three up reroll in ones, it's it's tough to chew through that now mortal wounds obviously are the weakness uh, and uh here we don't have you know Teclis's aura but potentially you know having the lord regent or the cathlar with protection of hish uh could help you know keep them alive against mortals as well um but again so this gives you a, a bowling ball of a little hero it's like you know a, a mini go track that you can throw forward in certain matchups get into heroes or get into units kill stuff you know potentially be trouble for your opponent to deal with or he's you know a good counter punch piece because again you have a bunch of wardens and sentinels that are going to be the primary pieces that your opponent wants to take out uh and he can be a good counter punch he can you know fight uh, any battle line unit off of an objective um so a good little piece uh so again maybe not the the most optimized pick um because of you know the prevalence of mortal wounds in the game right now but man in in two out of three of your matches he has the opportunity to be a, a big pain he's doing mortal wounds in his shooting phase on a roll of a two yep. plus he's doing d3 or on a five plus he's doing d6 mortal wounds with an 18 range um threat so the fact that you don't have to hit or wound with it is is really good to kind of ignore look at sir and start taking down you know your opponent's heroes um the fang sword of altharian and having ren three and all of his attacks like hit on twos wound on threes so consistent. Get, and he gets plus one to wound when he charges and apply a reroll once to hit from a, a command ability all of a sudden um that is that could be quite a a, a yeah. combat monster and even like at the start of the combat you pick one friendly hero enemy hero so one enemy hero within um three and you're doing additional damage to it from the um yep. from the, the, the exploding blade. sixes to hit like yeah. like I, I guess that that's where the challenge is getting it into combat yep. because its base move is six so um any way you can speed that up yeah. um so so you can do 12 no matter what on your turn. So so without Speed of Hish, which obviously is a spell cast, which adds some unreliability, just from the command ability, you can, you can move 6 inches. If you want to move 12, you can 100% move 12. There's nothing your opponent can do to stop you as long as you have the command points, um, which is, again, just for that reliability is always nice. But in conjunction with things like Speed of Hish, obviously that goes up to 18. Um, but the real spice is that you know, again, most everything moves six inches in, in Lumineth that's not mounted. Um, so that's 18 movement, 18 inch movement on things like your wardens and sentinels, but pretty much your wardens. Uh, but they also do get that pre-day movement. Mm. So that, that, uh, that 18 inches is actually 24 inches. So and, I, so, and I will, and I will say if the board size does change in AOS three mm -hmm. and it gets smaller, Wow, wow, we are. So, so this is again looking at um, one of again looking at the challenges of Lumineth. One is is applying damage where you need it, and you can do that from with your shooting with your sentinels. But sentinels have low volume of shots. Now, obviously, it's the the range really helps. But wardens, you you take twenty wardens, and they literally have to attach, so they do double the damage of sentinels at twenty points cheaper. If you can get them in the place you want them. They're the they're they're our best hammer, and especially you know when you're moving 18 or 24 inches, um, you know in conjunction with your three inch range on your weapons, it's very easy to get all 30 wardens into a target. Um, like like I, I more often than not I'm getting all my attacks in with a 30 or 20 block, um, and so again so this allows you to th you know throw around 30 wardens 20 wardens potentially both of them because you can move one 24 inches if it has speed of hish you can move the other one 18 inches so i mean some missions that's th outside of three of your opponent at worst it's outside of six um so you again you can do that you throw ethereal on a unit um you can use i know reroll ones to hit obviously with potentially free com the free command point uh, if you don't have other needs you know, things to need it for is huge with the, um, 
with the mortal wound output on fives and sixes, um, like 30 wardens do, are doing, you know, at 360 points, if you're getting all of them into combat, they're doing 20 mortal wounds before we roll ones to hit. So, but uh, trade-off, obviously. And, 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 and your sentinels are probably chipped down the, that unit that's going into combat with the wardens. Well. Um, so they're probably not fighting at full strength. And, or you're taking down those key synergy pieces that are going to make them even better. Yep. Now, the, the big weakness to wardens is screens, obviously. So sometimes, um, you know, if you can get Lambent Light on a target, which, again, you have the Dawn Riders with Lambent Light, and you can do a pre-day move with Dawn Riders, so they can move 14 inches. So between the 14-inch pre-day move, you're definitely in Lambent Light range of whatever you want to shoot. You have one unit to shoot down that target, potentially two if you need to, or kill screens because honestly sometimes you just want to kill screens so that your wardens can get into the opponent and tie a ton of shit up excuse my language tie a ton of stuff up and um it, you know stick around and just be a nuisance like how how like how annoying is it to deal with 30 wardens in your deployment zone turn one that are ethereal um you know, you have potentially immunities to battle shock with the Cathlar, who again is in train piece behind them, um, and then. Uh, yeah, so, I'm so I also... I'm so glad you get all of these benefits. I'm so glad, like as a Gargan player with my four war scrolls and my no battalions and my nothing, I'm so glad you get all these cool things. This is the thing. It's it's great. It's a, it's awesome if you get it all off. You lose one of those things, and it starts to fall apart because you know. It's, they they are someone uncasts or you don't get um hitching twin stones off or hitching twin stones gets unbound and you can't recast it that happened to me recently in a game with with ridge uh and his staven and it, you know it took it put me from turn one i was like going to run away with this game and turn two i was on the back foot because i didn't have hitching twin stones uh, and and you don't get your lambent lights off and your uh, power yeah. of hitches off then you're not you're not doing that damage. You're not getting that output. You're not killing the units that you need to kill. Uh, so, and if you've uh, listened, if you've listened to an hour and a half of this already, guys, um, and you are not a Lumineth player, you know, really listening to Jordan, listening to Hayden, and listening to what those critical spells are, and looking at ways that you can integrate something to stop Jordan doing what he wants to do. <laughs> Um, prime example, you know, get a Knight in Cantor, which has the auto unbind scroll. Looking at some of the things that get like the Rune Lord, for example, is plus two to unbinding. Looking for ways that you can stop him from getting his twin stones or particular spells. Um, yep. So if you're listening to this, trying to work out how to beat the local Lumineth player, um, and that kind of ties into what Alex is also asking, it's, it's understanding and looking at your tools and going, right, what can I tap into? Um, uh, and, and to Alex's question, I want to transition, is a lot of the, the list you're talking about so far in both of the ones that you've shared are probably heavily towards magic and shooting. Is that how you're finding the ideal Lumineth tournament list is looking at the moment? Because I notice there's no stone guards. I'm noticing that you're not tapping into um, a, a, a lot of the combat output. It's more shooting, a lot of more magic, a lot more movement board control. Is that how you're finding Lumineth at the moment. I, I think actually Lumineth is best when they're balanced. So so obviously the Hell on Nation was all shooting. Um, my first iteration of that list is you don't have the shark, you drop one of the heroes and you take two units of wardens for to screen out your sentinels, potentially help with getting the, you know them in combat without dying so they can double shoot or get the extra shot from their allegiance ability. But I, I think it's it's a balance. And actually I would I would push back uh, on your point of I think wardens are the best combat hammer in Lumineth and you just can't utilize them outside of Alumnia because they're slow movement and uh, you know those restrictions where here you get again you put you flip that on its head you're now 24 inch move you're getting anywhere you want to outside of screens and they don't have fly or anything so it's uh, not complete freedom but and what they got three three inch attacks as well. Like they yeah. they've got really wow. long. Uh, so so getting the and, th and that's always been the challenge is that you've been a slow moving castle, which has kind of worked for having techless at the moment. But mm -hmm. um, and I think it was to Zach's point in the chat is that when when you start introducing techless into a Lumineth list, 
you start to dominate some of the mid tables, right? But then the minute you start going top tables, you start taking on the Seraphons, yep. you start taking on the Zenchers, you start taking on the Carriage and Overlords. They've got the tools to handle Techless. So you start going backwards. So um, I'm not saying don't take Techless, but please, that's if you love Techless, we're not saying don't take Techless. But know that, you know, you've got to start thinking about hard counters. And in um, Alumnia, for example, getting the pre-game move, that's one really good way to introduce techless and protect them from some of the things that would take them yeah. down before you've gone of got out of first gear. Yeah. And that's a, a really good point. Actually, I did want to talk about uh, how to fit techless in this list if you are if you want to play techless. I, I love playing with techless. I love playing without him. Um, I love him a lot in Alumnia, again, like we've talked about. Um, how I change this list is dropping uh, Light of Altharian, Lord Regent, uh, 10 Sentinels, and the Battalion, and Extra Command Point. Um, or maybe, I don't remember what the points are, but if you can keep the Extra Command Point, that's good. But you know, those, those again, you, you know, 50 Wardens, you know, 20, 30 Sentinels, Cathlar, Tetlis, and, and 5 Dawn Riders, or you can you know, interchange any of those pieces uh, pretty easily as well if you want the lord regents instead of the dawn riders to you know more reliably have power of hish off and also lord regent like here, here's the i think the thing people are sleeping on with him just to go off on a little ta tangent with lord regent yeah people are like okay i already have power of hish right i don't need mm. a sudden cast of it one it's it's reliability but what it does is it frees up your other casters so Again, you you saw I have redundancy of speed of hish and, and ethereal blessing on my units because those are two really important spells, and it means if I have to split my army in two, which you often do because of objectives, it means I have ethereal blessing and speed of hish with each group. Um, so, so then it lets uh, let's say I, I'm able to cast. You know, you can use your aether cords to double cast a unit, so it can do its you know spell. It, it, sorry, it's um. Power of Hish as well, it's it's a chosen spell, but you can also use the Lord Regent, you cast him, and even you know his spell goes off and it affects D3 units. Even if you just get a one or two, you put it on the one unit where you want to cast their chosen spell. So you put it on the Sentinels so that they can cast Ethereal Blessing on the Wardens. Uh, and your Wardens, you know, they double Aether, course, Aether Quartz, uh, so they could put Speed of Hish on themselves as well. And so that you now you get all the buffs that you need um throwing it forward again not you know throwing them in tying stuff up uh, but again i you can also throw a tech list in this list like i said and, and further you know i love uh not taking spell portal you can i i run it you know 50 50 with it's, spell a, bi portal. it's a big it's a big cost like so i many. know when i yeah. I know when I was running it in my Hallow Heart, which is an equivalent to Lumineth, um, it was only 60 points at the time, and it was a fair trade-off. Now that it's 80 points and I start adding other endless spells or other things, like 80 points is a lot. And um, if you don't get it – is it 70 now? Yeah. It might be the bound one you saw was 80. Probably. I'm, I've done too many <laughs> Seraphon shows as well. Um, either, either way, like uh, – it's it's still a big points cost, and if you're not getting the value out of it, um, and obviously with the Cathala, you can get incredible value. Um, and it's but go on. I find you only need a turn one, really, and mm. you know even with Techless, yes, you can get you know the, his AOE spell off turn one. But again, with the board control moving up as aggressively as you can with this list, Techless is mid you know mid board as soon as turn two comes. You don't need spell portal anymore, um, and Turn one, it lets you make your your wardens ethereal. It lets you you know guarantee you get speed of hish off and, and other buffs. So turn one, I use them as a buff piece. Um, it, there are some trade offs, obviously. Um, sometimes you want to have you know the anti horde spell turn one and stuff like that. But again, I don't think we're we're tied you know tied to it anymore where we have to take spell portal. So. I think the challenge, and, and, we, and we're kind of already transitioning into like the final thoughts, because to me, and I, I just want to go back to a point that you made that I think is important to just focus on for a minute. And that is, is that when you go down into the castle, the traditional castle, that castle can only be one place at, at any point in time. And when you start going to scenarios or battle plans that have six objectives, or you've got to capture your opponents and also you know, retain yours, that that castle isn't flexible. So 
as you said, even just thinking about having two independent forces that can move up and manipulate and move around the board, that's important. Because you can't think about, right, I'm going to have Teclas and the Cathala, I'm going to have Stone Guard, and I'm going to have my Wardens and my Sentinels, and it's this bubble that's going to be impenetrable, and I'm going to be protected by my Shrine, and like, cool, but how do you move around and get six objectives, four yeah. objectives, seven objectives? It's, um, it, it, it can be a very tough, tough, tough time. And you'll yeah. and you'll lose on you'll lose on the on the victory points. Yeah, and and Alumnia, you know, helps with that compared to like Sire, where Sire, uh, like I said, you know, said before, it's like you're playing for the tie, or late game win most of the time. You know, in, in tougher games, sometimes again, you know, I a lot of my perspective is, is kind of looking at the the top meta armies, like the ones that are you know, where Lumineth, you know, is is going you know toe to toe in tough matchups. Obviously, Lumineth ha- does as you alluded to earlier, has the potential to dominate some of the mid to low tier armies, uh, which which I think that's more of where you can, you know, see some of the, the you know, armies that don't have the tools that, you know, challenge with, you know, facing Lumineth, whereas you look at the top meta or, you know, the top third of the meta, Lumineth is like, you know, on even footing at best, if not a little behind. I feel like, I feel like Lumineth is the gatekeeper to the top tables like Carriage and Overlords. Mm-hmm. So Carriage and Overlords are very good at what they do, but are they a consistent 5-0 and o army? No. Um, I think Carriage and Overlords is exactly the same. It's like this 4-1 type army, like four wins at a tournament. It can it can go five, don't get me wrong, but it's it's more of a gatekeeper to maybe some of the stronger builds. And who, who, who are the armies that you worry about most with these types of lists? So... Is it your traditional at the moment Seraphon, Zench? Um, I think well, Seraphon, yes, yeah, Seraphon, Zench, um, Deepkin can be tough. Obviously, those are all, you know, all the common ones. I what, mean, what, what makes Deepkin tough to you? What, 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 what makes Deepkin tough? Is it the speed? Um, is it the yeah. combat potential? The, the, yeah. So speed, combat potential. Looking at the, the in context of the alumni list, anything that can kill our bodies fast. Is very scary. So, um, I recently played two games against my brother, um, and he's playing a Zinch Eternal Confederation, like dirty, dirty flamer shooting build. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I played it with Sire, and it was a really close match um, that that he won in, in, in turn five. Then we played Alumnia versus that list, and Alumnia I think makes you a lot better against like potentially Seraphon and some of the other armies. But it is not the best, better choice against um, uh, Zinch, and especially Eternal Confederation, where I don't have the double Aether Quartz. Man, mm. I, I was, you know, turn three, I didn't have bodies left because he can just chew through me so fast. I only have, you know, one turn with plus one save, and you know, so oh, I can they're only all rent, they're, all, they're all like rend two, yeah, rend one know, or two, exactly. Mortal so, wounds out, yeah. So that can be really tough, especially, um, uh, you know. Any, they, they can with the teleports and KO's teleport, they can stretch uh, Lumineth. So on, on some missions that can be tough. Other ones it's okay. Um, but yeah. Fire Slayers, I imagine, as Matt's pointed out, would be would be quite tough for you. Um, I, I don't know what your community's like, but there's just not a lot of Fire Slayers players around me. It seems like the army that no one wants to play, despite uh, the constant attempts to make them the best army in the world. Just no one likes running naked baby dwarves. Yeah. Um, Her- Hermdar can can be tough potentially. Um, now me and me and uh, Zach on the channel played a game recently with Fire Slayers, and he wasn't running Herm Hermdar, and we saw how punishing the bravery stuff was against them um, because of that like the flipping battle shock and locking a unit down in combat. So that was hugely impactful. But if if you're in Hermdar and fighting on objectives, then they don't care about battle shock, and and that takes you know huge tools out of Lumineth's book. Um, mm. So there, you, you know, you try and fight them not on objectives, or you know, <laughs> shoot them with your sentinels. Well, that's um, where the sentinels being, because one of the challenges with fire slayers is always getting to those little key heroes at the backfield. Mm. And you know, you've actually got the tools, and you know, you're really just fishing for the mortal wounds. You couldn't yep. care about lookout, sir. You're just fishing for mortal wounds, um, and you probably have enough damage to take them out and stop them from tunneling, stopping them from being as durable as they are yeah potentially but i mean 
you see a lot of lists with you know two of the deep striking heroes, and so they bring a unit of twenty hearth guard and a, another hero, the the general. Then they have three heroes that you have to kill before they get rid of that you know four up save. So that's where uh, you know one of Deepkin's challenges is is multi targets. You know they're really good at killing whatever they get Lambent Light on. Really bad at spreading their attacks around. Um, um. So you you look at you know you have twenty sentinels you're not killing three heroes you're killing one reliably and, and even if you split ten on ten you're probably not killing either unless you have lambent light on one yeah yeah no no there's a lot of yeah there's a lot of chip damage there's a lot of like point and mm -hmm. click that you're right like you, that and that's maybe where the the eighty archers in England for example some of those lists are just that's how you get rid of those threats very early on. Um, but yeah. that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. No, I, I mean, I'm not for me. Oh God, painting that many sentinels does not sound like a good time at all. I made the mistake of painting all my trim a different color than the rest of it, so oh, it's painful. Now that we're kind of wrapping up, and you know, we haven't quite finished mm -hmm. just yet. Don't, don't, um, don't not like and subscribe at this particular point. Um, but you know, feel free to do so. By the way, under a hundred, hundred subs left, and we hit ten thousand, and I'm going to open a nice. merch store. Awesome. I'm going to, yeah, almost, almost at ten k, almost at ten k. We, we um, want so, those pretty dice you teased. Yeah, man, I got so many dice; it's uncanny. But um, like, what have you learned playing with this list? Because again, the book has changed so much in twelve months, and you've already shared so much knowledge and insight here. Um, and there's a lot of different things you can tweak, right? You know, we haven't talked ballistas, we haven't talked about the twins, we haven't talked about um, some of the other heroes. We there's just so much list tech in this army, which I think is really cool. And much like Cities of Sigma, which is the army that I play a lot of it has the ability to adapt to the meta and should we go into a more combat route, you've got some combat tools. If it's all about supercasters, you've got techless. You've just got a lot of tools and you know Games Workshop is going to invest because we know there's half of the, um, the the Tyrian nation to come. Assuming that it's going to be Lumineth, I think, who knows, it's not going to be a whole new force. But Before Lumineth came out, I made the prediction that Tyrion was going to join Deepkin and that might have just been wishful thinking, but that would be pretty cool. I mean, just just deep can talk like in deep in lore, they talk about Tyrion a lot. Um, obviously, they're a little sour with Tetris, but they do talk about Tyrion a lot in the lore. And you know, so hey, Does that that'd be a bigger that would be a bigger riff than George and Harry, um, the Royals, like just it, absolute. Just I, um, I mean, it's it's not to happen. You, you see so many you know clues to him in in the Lumineth lore and books, and even models showing that. Uh, the you know the, symbols of Tetris, the statue, and symbols of well, Tyrion. It, exactly. Doesn't yeah, yeah. doesn't the uh, the Lord Regent have the? Is it the statue, the Tyrion statue on top? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't. There's that, and that, like the the banner blade. His big banner has a, the Tyrion symbol for you know Selenar, and the, there's a whatever dragon or whatever uh, for Tet or sorry Tyrion Tetris mixing those up. But yeah, so it's obviously coming from Lumineth is, is what I expect. But fair enough. But have you, have you, is there anything like any final thoughts that you would share with, with the guests based on your Lumineth experience? Or maybe as we start approaching the tournament season, some things that you're considering either preparing for AOS 3, whether it is currently thinking about your army in the meta. Um, if you want to be successful with Lumineth, you have to get lots of experience with them. And that's not even just i'm not even talking about playing games obviously you play games play lots of games but man like you roll you got to sit at home and you know roll a random mission and a random army that you're going to play against and practice your deployment and think about your spells and where you're putting twin stones and uh, the order of operations of what you're casting and um that'll help you like you got to be quick you know again it's it's so integral to play like you know, get to the late game with Lumineth because that's when they turn the corner and win. Uh, so you have to be fast, and it's it's tough. So you gotta know, you gotta know what list spells you want to cast, especially if you have tech lists. It's it's faster and simpler for simpler if you're not going with a tech list uh, build. So maybe start there, if, you know, when you're getting started. But when you start introducing tech lists or multiple spell lores. Um, you got to know your key spells. So have a short list of what you want in different matchups. So that's where it's like, 
I, I know the four I want to cast it in Seraphon with maybe one or two that are situational depending on their deployment. Um, and, and you just got to be fast with it. And th that just takes repetition and practice. Like I played Ridge, another one of our, our uh, guys on our, you know, our team, um, a bunch with his Seraphon on TTS even. And we played a game and went through deployment. And then, I, you know, so we played the game and then we actually replayed the game with a different strategy turn one, uh, just to see how, how the outcome changes and, you know, maybe improvements after learning from the first game, because it's again, testing and practice. And then literally, the next evening, so we did that for probably three, four hours. The next e evening, I spent another three, four hours uh, just redoing my turn one and or turn one and two and just going through deployment and like, okay, if I take this strategy, throwing these two units, I want these spells off or I'm concentrating all my buffs on one unit or have spell portal, I don't have spell portal. Again, testing to see you know what's, what's best situationally. It's, there's so many options. And if you don't go into it knowing what you want to do, you're going to not only be really slow, which is you know where you start making it a boring game at times or annoying game for your opponent, which is never the experience you want to give someone, but you're also going to you know make the wrong decision because you're just trying to think last minute and you have uh, 23, 24, 25 spells to think through. You're gonna. It's it's. You can't. You can't do that on, on you know on a dime. I, I've I've played Lumineth armies in the past where the hero phases do take a lot of time. Um, and you know if you're learning this for the first time, you know we don't expect you to be um you know off the cuff. You know every little spell at every single time. But I think to what you just said is like what are the tools available? Whether it's AOS reminders, whether it is um I know people have made spell cards in the past. You know the Magic the Gathering has some really cool um you can create your own magic, the gathering yeah. cards. So people will actually make spell cards that they can, they can play and have a deck of them. So they know which ones to cast or, you know, even label it like this is my Cathala spell. This is this spell. This is that spell. Um, practice. And there's been plenty of times you, to what you just said that I will practice my deployment and my turn one. And you might set up a game tonight where literally that's it. You're, all you're doing is going to practice deployment and then turn one and then see what the different outcomes are going to be because because uh, your hero phase is so heavy. Yeah. Lumineth hero phase is so heavy. And to what we've just spoken about for the last almost two hours, you, you don't get the right spell off or if you, you don't have something in range or you, know, you find yourself out of position – that's where Lumineth starts to crumble. So mm -hmm. knowing knowing those types of triggers will help you when you go to play in match plays. Yep, exactly. And you got again you not only for your opponent's sake, where you always want to you know be, be clear with your opponent of like with your army and whatnot, but you want to you want to be fast. You want to get through the game at all costs. Like not only not only for I mean number one for providing a good game for your opponent should always be the number one priority. Uh, so, so being respectful to your opponent, knowing you know, knowing your stuff. Um, when you're practicing, obviously everyone you know talk with your opponent. Be like, hey, I'm learning, and to be a little slow with my army as I'm getting started. Um, you know, have the discussion in advance. So, and most people won't care if it's a casual practice game. Um, but that that way, put in the experience, put in the reps. You'll be so much better off when it comes to the event. And it'll, it honestly, it'll even put your opponent on the back foot. They know how tough. Lumineth is, and if you instantly know what spells you're casting and you're just banging them off, they're going to be like, wow, this guy knows what he's doing. He's confident. So I got to you know, watch out. And this might be a nice segue to kind of bring it home. And if people want to learn more about Lumineth and want to see it in action and kind of Jordan talking about his theory crafting on the tabletop, you might have a channel, Seasons of War. <laughs> Go check it out. Go watch Jordan put this stuff into practice and um, and go see how he's moving around his Shining Company. Go see what what spell orders it when and what he does. And I think, you know, to, to, to wrap it up, experience is so important and um, getting those reps in. Um, I can't stress enough that the early decisions at the start of the game can often lead to the outcome. So rep, rep, repeating your deployment, repeating turn one, and just getting that, mm -hmm. you'll make better decisions long-term. Oh yeah, for sure. And um, Grumdy's saying that the channel's yeah. not half bad. So um, 
They're, they're all right. Seasons of War. No, go do, go do check them out. Grundy, <laughs> Grundy is like one of the very first people to uh, support, you know, subscribe and support the channel. So it's, uh, I'm actually looking forward, you know, with the, we were talking before this about the, you know, events that Games Workshop is putting on uh, in the States and Grundy's down in Texas. So I know to get a game in with him if, uh, if I make yeah. it down there. He's, uh, he's offered me barbecue, so uh, I want to come down. I would love to come. I can't leave my country just yet, but um, would love to come back to get some uh, Texas barbecue. And, oh, yeah, to, to Matt's point as well, like, I'm a Hello Heart player, so I feel like I'm well-trained to prepare for Settler's Gain, which is essentially oh, yeah. like yeah. like half Cities of Sigma, one in four Lumineth, one in four Stormcast. I get the best of all words. But, um any shout outs, anything you want to kind of say before we kind of bring this home and um, I let you go do your thing with your kids and I go do my Saturday thing? Oh, I, I, I would give shout outs to everyone. Obviously, I love Warhammer. I, we have an amazing community around AOS. So shout outs to everyone like, you know, uh, Grumdy. There's a ton of guys in the chat that I've seen that I recognize all their names from, you know, from our streams and comments and whatnot. So uh, super appreciate everyone who, you know, uh, you know, watches our content as well and, and you know, supports us through there, you know, means a ton to us as well as have to give a shout out to, to our uh, season of war team. So, um, all the, you know, all the guys that you see on the channel doing bat reps, uh, we have a ton of fun playing together. We play the dirtiest, nastiest lists against each other and have a ton of fun doing it. Uh, and, you know, we go through the highs and lows together and know that, you know, we're all in it to have fun. And at the end of the day, it's, you know, uh, that's what it's all about. So uh, just shout out to this amazing community. So, so thankful. Uh, you know, this is a great game. Golden Age compared to you know, Hashtag blessed. Warhammer. Hashtag blessed. Warhammer, yeah. Ten years ago, even the community support we're getting from GW. It's like there's always room for improvement with everything. But compared to, you know, when we were, I'm sure you, you can attest, you know, older years, it's like, amazing time to be in the hobby awesome to see aos doing so well and continuing to bring more people in uh so if you're thinking of diving in do it it's an amazing game awesome people around it so shout Man, out to you watched, if they've watched two and a half hours already uh i feel like they're well invested or at least they're going to be getting involved though so, rock thank you very much um, and if you have enjoyed this stuff, please subscribe. I'm under a hundred subscribers left and then I, I can like retire on a boat and never have to come back on. Actually, no, don't say that. They'll, yeah. they'll, they'll unsubscribe. No, uh, there'll be no boats if I hit 10 K, uh, I don't know, but we are, we are doing a celebration stream in a few weeks time if you are watching this live. Nice. So Jordan, thank you so much. This has been insightful. I've learned a lot about Lumineth. Between you and the Hayden show, I feel well equipped to have um, really cool games and get a better understanding of how I fight Lumineth. I've also learned a lot about how I might build my Settlers gain and bring in some Lumineth into my Cities of Sigma. And um, you probably haven't quite got me yet on playing Lumineth, but that fox, man, that fox. I just want to put two tails on it like Sonic and Tails and That's run this little awesome. fox around the table and be annoying. Yeah. 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 That just I think you just gave me a perfect paint scheme for him. The orange? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. That's good. I uh, like it. <laughs> that's still my idea. Right, I'm Jordan. 100% am. I'm so, no, no, no. no shame. You're a jerk. All right, I'm going it's before Jordan says any more of my ideas. the size of the world. <laughs> I have to grudge you now for whose tail. That's okay. All right, Jordan, everybody, thank you guys. Until next time, uh, name your heroes and look forward to you in AOS 3. Cheers. I hope you found that discussion valuable. If you did, give the video the old thumbs up. And if you have a comment or an insight, leave it in the comment section below. The champions over here are my AOS Coach Patreons and YouTube members. So you guys are bloody legends. Thank you for all the support. If you want to know more about the support programs, the links are below down here in the episode description, along with the link to the Discord server, so we can continue this conversation. Until next time, don't forget to name your characters and have a good one.